Like he's stating a proper motivation, which consists of three parts. Refuge field. <coughs> Visualize Buddha Shakyamuni instead of holding the Dalai Lama and all the enlightened beings in front of you. And how you visualize them. They are your very affectionate parents. And you come home demoralized from the school, being bullied by elder children. And your parents are waiting there to give full love, affection, attention, and embrace. And the body of the field, visualize the two kind parents on the two sides. All your family members, including your children, and everyone, including the animals, insects, all living creatures. And here you are the mother, and all others are like your children. <coughs> they imagine that they come home demoralized, and you are there to give full love, affection, attention, and embrace. To the extent that each one of them feels themselves as so special in your eyes. <coughs> and the purpose of this class is to identify, is to discover ultimate source of happiness that exists within each one of us. Like uh, gold, when mixed with the soil, the gold is not visible. In the eyes of the ordinary people, it is just a useless soil, but in the eyes of the experts, this is a very precious uh, combination, the gold mixed with the soil. By removing the soil, the gold inside will start to glow, likewise. By removing the mental defilements, this treasure of happiness, ultimate treasure, treasure of happiness within us will start to glow. <clears throat> so this defilement, which obscures this beautiful and very precious treasure of the happiness within us, this defilement, we have to, to identify them, coming to know that this defilement is finally rooted to the ignorance and the stains of the ignorance. The counterforce of the ignorance is the wisdom. The wisdom to remove the darkness of ignorance. It is only to introducing the light of the wisdom to dispel this darkness. So this the wisdom has to be triggered, motivated by a very compassionate mind of enlightenment for the benefit of sentient beings. So what we're doing here is meant to activate the wisdom to know the reality as it is, so that you're not under the sway of the ignorance anymore. And thus you become like a sun, not being affected by any external factors. Likewise, that because of this knowledge, because of this wisdom, because of this wisdom driven by this unconditional compassion to us all, you become the that we become the vulnerabilities within us are er eradicated, that we become so stable that no external factors can affect us any anymore. So at that point, one has achieved total freedom from external factors, one has achieved total, total peace and total nirvana. So with that mind, let's turn to page two. Imagine that you are leading this and all, everyone, including your parents, including your family members, they're all joining us in this journey. <coughs> page two. And thus by great compassion, you taught the Makura Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. And thus by great compassion, you taught the Makura Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. And thus by great compassion, you taught the Makura Dharma to dispel all perverted views to you, the Buddha Gautama, I pay homage. Independent origination, there is no ceasing, no arising, no annihilation, no permanence, no coming, no going, no separateness, and no sameness. I persuade to the consummate Buddha, the Supreme among all teachers, I want to talk this peace which is afraid of elaborations. I prostrate to the mothers of the Buddhas and of the hearers and Bodhisattvas. 
all these heresy in pacification to complete peace, who through the knowledge of past causes those having migrated to achieve the aims of the world, and through the possession of nations to subdue us for the varieties of all aspects. The one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher to guard and protect her to have made prostrations, the one who has eliminated the web of conceptualizations, and is endowed with the divine bodies of the vast and the profound, who eternally shines forth the forever noble light rays to you, the Buddha, and make prostrations. Page 7. <coughs> From the bottom. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth, may I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. I go for refuge until I'm enlightened to the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, by my accumulations of the practice of giving and so forth. May I become a Buddha to benefit all sentient beings. Sanya Jola Soge Chonam La Chanjo Bardo Dane Gapsuch Tage Jin Soge Sonam Ge Jola Benjir Sanya Jovare Jo Sanya Jola Soge Chonam La Chanjo Bardo Dane Gapsuch Tage Jin Soge Sonam Ge Jola Benjir Sanya Jovare Jo Sange Chodan Soge Chonam La Chanju Bardo Dani Chin Soge Be Sonam Ge Jola Benjir Sange Ju Barai All phenomena arise from causes. The causes are taught by the Tathagata. The sensation of causes as well as taught by the grace here. Om Ye Dharama He Tu Prabhava he tum te shantata gato yavata te sham chayo niroda e bambati mahashramana eswa om ye dharama he tum te shantata
गति experiences of happiness is the self-confidence and what underscores all the miseries that we go through is the self grasp and self-referential ego. So we see that these are the two forces within our mind, the self-confidence and the ego, the two things. And oftentimes these two are seen as mixed. When we see that self-confidence is increasing, our ego also goes up. And when we subdue the ego, self-confidence also goes down. So this is a tendency that happens to us now by learning inverse mind training, by learning, for example, the text which we're studying, we should see how much to increase our self-confidence in the face of challenges and how much to subdue our ego despite we go through the challenges. So the more we are able to subdue the ego and boost our self-confidence by subduing the ego, all the miseries come to stop and by increasing the self-confidence all the virtues take root. So seeing that all virtues are there, if this will give you all the experiences of happiness and by seeing that self, the, the self-reference the ego goes down, all the miseries will come to an end. So this is the whole purpose of the life. Oftentimes people ask the question as what is the meaning of life. So the meaning of life is to make it, to sum up, to train a mind, to tame a mind and in the process to subdue the ego and the boost of self-confidence. Okay, so eight verse of my training, this is the right means to do this purpose for us. With that in mind, let's turn to page 19. With the determination to achieve the highest aim for the benefit of all sentient beings, which surpasses even the wishful fulfilling gem, may hold them dear at all times. Whenever I interact with someone, I view myself as the lowest in all, and from the very depths of my heart, respectfully hold others as superior. In all my deeds may I probe into my mind, and as soon as mental and emotional afflictions arise, as they endanger myself and others, may I strongly confront them and avert them. When I see beings of unpleasant character, oppressed by strong negativity and suffering, may I hold them dear, for they are rare to find, as if I have discovered a true treasure. When others are of jealousy, treat me wrongly with abuse, slander, and scorn. May I take upon myself the defeat and offer to others the victory. When someone whom I have helped or in whom I have placed great hopes, mistreats me in extremely hurtful ways, may I regard him still as my precious teacher. In brief, may I offer a benefit and joy to all my mothers, both directly and indirectly. May I quietly take upon myself all hers and pains from my mothers. May all this remain undefiled by the stains of eight mundane concerns, and may I recognize in all things the solutions, the mode of clinging be released from bondage. From my two collections, vast the space that I have amassed from working with effort at this practice for a great length of time, may I become the chief leading Buddha for all those whose minds wisdom has blinded by ignorance. Okay, five minutes of breathing meditation. <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> uh, the meditation that we're going to do here is a very simple breathing meditation. And this requires four points to be to keep in mind. One, body posture. Number two is the focal point we're going to meditate on. And number three is identifying the errors of meditation. Number four is applying the remedies to overcome the errors. Four points to keep in mind. Number one, body posture. For the body posture, so if possible, sit cross-legged. If not, it doesn't matter. This is not really mandatory. 
Number two is body upright. That is very important. Body must be upright. Body should be upright. And while you keep your body upright, it should not be stiff. It should be flexible. It should be flexible. Number two. And number three, your head tilt it forward a little bit. Number four, your eyes not closed. Your eyes half open. 45 degrees cast down. And oftentimes you meet with the same people meditate with eyes closed. There's nothing wrong in it, but it is best to start with the meditation with eyes open. If you learn how to do meditation with eyes open, then you will also automatically you will know how to do the meditation with eyes closed. Whereas if you learn with eyes closed, you will never learn how to do the meditation with eyes open. On top of that, the meditation is finally to make uh, for our job is to make the meditation become a part of your second nature. Which means that uh, see if you can be a part, make the meditation a part of your day-to-day -day experience, day-to-day -day experience. So most of the time in a day you keep your eyes open. So with eyes open, if you're trained to do meditation, then you can it can become a part of your second nature. With eyes open, you can still meditate. Whereas if you keep your meditate, do meditation with eyes closed all the time, then most of the time in your day, you will keep your eyes open, so you cannot meditate. So this is the demerit, one. And then the tip of the tongue should touch the upper palate. Tip of the tongue should touch the upper palate to avoid excessive accumulation of saliva in the mouth when you meditate. <clears throat> and the teeth and the lips keep them in the natural course. Breathe naturally. Don't impose on your breath. Don't force your breath. Don't, don't control your breath. And then write your, your right hand to your left hand. And the tips of the two thumbs joining, forming triangle. Place the two hands on the laps in restful state. Okay, this is your body posture. Number two, the focal point. We're going to meditate on. You're going to meditate on the tiny drop. Tiny drop, 1 mm or 2 mm in diameter. Um, the visualize between the nose and upper lip. This is a place where you meditate. This tiny white drop, 1 mm or 2 mm in diameter. While you focus your mind here, multitasking, count your breath. Breathe in, breathe out, cycle one. Breathe in, breathe out, cycle two. This is how we're going to do for five minutes. Say so at home, if you're a beginner, it is best to do this not really for five minutes, rather do it for like, uh, say, 21 cycles. 21 cycles is like one and a half minutes. If you're successful with this, again, you can keep a gap of like a few seconds, then you can do the second round, third round. But here we're going to do five minutes altogether. In group is fine. When you're by yourself, don't do it for too long. Okay. Then number three is identifying the errors of meditation. While you meditate, the, the dangers and the errors that can potentially happen to us is twofold. One is mental laxity, another one is mental, is mental excitement. Mental laxity is when you become when your mind becomes very heavy and very lethargic and uh, very inserviceable. And the mental excitement is when your mind sc starts scattering here and there. So should any of these two things happen, you, you go for the number four. Number four is applying the remedies to overcome the errors. And the remedies there are two, introspection and mindfulness. Introspection is to keep an eye on your own mind. Say if you have a pet loss, if you have a pet dog, you lost the pet dog, the first thing that you do is you go, go to search a pet dog. So go to search a pet dog is analogous to introspection. So your mind is like the pet dog and you lose track of this mind. With this mind is simply scattered or it is in a lax form. Then you just see well, what your mind is doing. So that is known as mindfulness. When you see that the mind is distracted or in a lax form, then the job of the introspection is done. Next is the job of the mind, the, sorry, next is the job of the mindfulness. Job of the mindfulness is like the rope. When you see the dog, when you find the dog, then you bring the, the, the dog back home with the help of the rope. Likewise, bring the mind back to the internal of your meditation with the help of the rope of the mindfulness. Okay, this is what we're going to do for five minutes. Ready?
If we turn to page three of this of the prayer book, page three, the first stanza which reads, "The one who is transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teachers who guard and protect her to hear my persuasions." 
I remember His Holiness in public teachings as well as during, say, the my personal audience with His Holiness. This is I so clearly remember. This is perhaps one of the favorite stanzas of His Holiness, which he recites so often, and he tries to explain things on the basis of this stanza. Uh, I personally, whenever I start my meditation emptiness, every day I include this stanza to see as an inspiration for me. This is how I should be following my transformation, following my path. So which reads, the one who is transformed into the reliable guide. So this is the main thesis. Find out what I should be doing. Find out I should become a reliable guide to, to guide as many beings towards enlightenment, towards happiness. How should you do it? If this is the goal that you are seeking, then what is the driving force? What is the, the motivation? Motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings. Not for the not the motivation for one's fame, not for material gains, not for anything else, but out of genuine compassion towards human beings. So this I'd like to share with you that um, there are this motivation, that motivation of altruism. Wanting to benefit others, wanting to benefit others out of compassion, out of love and affection towards others. So this, the question is raised as to say, one is the compassion element and the other one is the knowledge element, the knowledge and the compassion. As to which of the two should come first, this is a question. And this is a very serious discussion being um, the carried on in many of the um, these the authoritative texts as which of the two should come first say the knowledge first the, with the knowledge then we eventually will come to know that the knowledge of interdependency knowledge of interdependency that finally everything is dependent on each other that my happiness depends on others, my miseries also depends on others. If I misbehave with other people, then I'll be in misery. If I've been kind to others, I'll be happy. So we see there's a mutuality of dependence. Mutuality of dependence. So this knowledge of dependency will invariably lead you towards towards becoming com compassionate. This is one thing. Knowledge driving you towards compassion. Number two is compassion driving you towards knowledge. There are two things. Compassion driving towards knowledge is some people, since childhood, since childhood, one is more prone towards compassion. Intuitively, or say, someone has a very uh, say inborn quality of love and affection towards others, inborn quality, naturally gifted compassion. So this is also the air. So these people, when they are tremendously compassionate towards others, then how can I benefit others? This question arises. So how can I benefit others? It's not that if the other person is so keen if the other person is so keen on, say, knowledge of physics, then if you really take care of that person, you should be able to teach physics. Or you should be able to guide the person to another teacher who can teach um, the physics. So then we see that, that with this love and affection, you will invariably go in search of the knowledge in order to help others. Okay, so there are two things, there are two versions. One, the, the knowledge, the wisdom drives you to become compassion, compassionate. Other, the knowledge, the, the wisdom, the compassion driving you, to, driving you to seek wisdom to help others. So 
So these two things are there. Now, um, which of the two things apply to me, apply to each one of us? That depends on the individual. That depends on the individual. Okay, so here, what we see here, the one who has transformed into the reliable guide, motivated by altruism to benefit system base, the teacher, so guard and subduer to your administrations. So this is in line with the biography of the compassionate Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni. How this young prince, young prince, as a prince, he, he was so sharp, so intelligent, and so wise, so smart. And meanwhile, his compassion towards the commoners, towards the poor people, towards the, the, the servants in the, the palace was just was so profound and so fast, amazingly loving and caring towards every creature. So we see that this young prince, Prince Siddharth, he was motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings. One. With this altruism to benefit sentient beings, so what should that person be doing? Person be doing, person be thinking of how to help others. To help others, we need to know how the beings are suffering, in what way the beings are suffering. So finally, we come to know that each one of us, we are all suffering because of, because of ignorance. Because of ignorance. And overall speaking, overall speaking, with the, the world today, since like 3,000 3, years ago, 5,000 years ago, now, today, education-wise, there's a tremendous emphasis on the upliftment of the education standard. So that is to lift the light of the knowledge that is so important. Knowing that, of course, there are many complications in this world today. And uh, as compared to those days, like 2,000 years ago, 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, and particularly, I think, like, say, when was the, anyone, anyone has any clue about, so when was the, how many years ago since early, the time of early men? Early men, early, early women? Any idea, Rimala? No? There was a latest report issued yesterday only, I think. It says about three and, a, three and a half lakh years. Three and a half? Lakh years. Lakh. Like they said the modern Homo sapiens, they found they did genetic mapping of that in terms of the number of years. The recent study says the estimate is much, much, much older than what they think. Okay. What are the science model yesterday only with these things? Okay, okay. <clears throat> so let's say many thousand years ago, many thousand years ago, the human beings first came into being and they are just they were just so uncivilized. Thinking was so uncivilized. And then um, the same who savors the physical mind? That is the the winner, there is the, the, the Lord. <coughs> this was how the, the human beings evolved. <coughs> so, um, as compared to those days, as compared to those days, and then second world, for example, let's say Second World War, and before that, in fact, we were very, it's, it's like a land of the barbarians. A land of barbarians, much more like that. So, as compared to those days, those days, uh, today is much better. But of course, again, because of the complications are there, in the name of say, religions and so forth, complications are there. But overall speaking, overall speaking, generally speaking, because of the rise in education, the living standard, things are better today. This is, you have to admit that. Okay, so the point is that the miseries, the pains are all because of the ignorance. The fact that, one of the facts that today there's a tremendous education in the world is a clear indication that ignorance is what is the cause of miseries. With the education, the light of the education, ignorance will be eliminated and the miseries will come to be, come to become less. So this is what is expected. So, and 
if you think very carefully, go more into the finer the exploration we come to realize that indeed all our misery somehow they are due to the ignorance. This is a fact. This fact, but we are not to believe in it. We are not to believe in it. We have to rationally think about it. We have to rationally gain conviction. Only through reasons we have to gain conviction that finally all our miseries they are due to ignorance. And don't think that these, uh, my miseries are created by Buddha, my miseries are created by Krishna, my miseries are created by Jesus Christ or God or whatever. Miseries are our self-creation, no doubt. Our self-grasping ignorance and self-centered doubt. These two are responsible for creating all our miseries. Somehow these two are connected. So with this, if we want to help others to eliminate their fear, to eliminate their, their miseries, then we have to teach them how to eliminate the ignorance, which is responsible. If you cut the root of the poisonous tree, however millions of poisonous leaves they might be growing there, they will all dry automatically if you cut the root. But if you cut from the top, cut the, the, the leaves, then for the next few weeks you may be relieved. But again the new leaves will grow, so it's not really the, the, of um, the benefit. Wise people will cut the root. Likewise, to eliminate all the miseries of yourself and others, the wisest thing to do is to cut the root. And the root is the self-grasping ignorance and self-centered attitude. So to cut the root, knowing that the root is the ignorance, it is only through cultivating the, uh, cultivating the light of the wisdom. So this light of the wisdom has to be taught to others. So for that, you should become the teacher of the wisdom. So, so it says, motivated by altruism to benefit sentient beings, the teacher. Wanting to benefit sentient beings, I should teach the light of the wisdom to others. So first to teach, you have to, you have to see whether it works. So this light of the wisdom, by introducing this light of the wisdom within yourself, see if it works to eliminate my fears, eliminate my the pain. So for that, we have to experiment it. By experimenting this, then what happens? The wisdom is being, you, you're being enriched with wisdom. Then the ignorance goes away more and more. As the ignorance finally becomes zero, then the, the wisdom that it gets becomes 100% or the complete. And as the wisdom becomes complete, the resultant state in the form of the sugada, in the form of the happiness, in the form of the bliss, becomes perfect. So that perfect state, state where your experience of happiness is the, the enriched, that is known as the sugadahood or the sugada. So with the experience of, with the, with the experimentation of this, what you are to teach the wisdom, then you experience the greatest of the bliss, greatest of the happiness, that is the sugada. So with this experience, then you can go to protect the being. So it says the teacher, sugada, and the protector to be the experience of sugada yourself then you can actually go to protect the beings uh, by giving this light of the wisdom and let them dispel the darkness of the ignorance and then experience the, the state of the, the deathlessness or the state of the fearlessness so this is how we should proceed now for this what is important for us at this stage is knowing that finally i have to in order to guide others in this life of the wisdom, I should have the wisdom myself. What wisdom? The wisdom to dissolve the ignorance of the self-grasping ignorance. So what is that wisdom like? The wisdom to see that the self is not something so solid to find as for us to grasp and to 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 it so tightly. So um, what are we doing here? Last time I think we left page 29. Um, stanza 243, the last stanza we finish. Stanza page 29. <coughs> we finish that? I missed the last stanza. Yes. 246. Okay. So 246 started, not started. You finished. Okay. So the point is how to, how to dismantle our grasping to the self. Finally, we see that all the problems somehow. We see that the problems are to do with the self, the ego, I, 
always, somehow, it is their ego. Okay. I say sometimes, even between the, let's say, the parents and children, and the parents, they scold the children because the parents love the children so much. It's irony. Parents love the children so much, and the, the, the child, for example, say, child becomes sick, right? Child becomes sick because he or she ate something wrong. That was unintentional. Who's going to eat wrong deliberately? Right, unless somebody wants to commit suicide. Otherwise, generally, people will not eat something wrong if the person knows that. And then, how do we know that this is expired, not expired? Then you eat something wrong, food poisoning happen, you become sick, and the parents become so angry towards the child. It's all come out of love. Love? And don't you anger towards the child? Why did you eat this? You stupid guy, you stupid boy, you stupid girl. Oftentimes, this happens, unfortunately. Where is? Whereas, and whereas the, the neighbors, the, with your neighborhood, in the neighborhood, there may be a mother or a father who says, oh, I'm very sorry that you ate this, you are food poison, I'm very sorry. Instead of scolding, why did you eat the wrong food? Why did you eat it at the time? Instead of scolding, and they may be so affectionate, I'm very sorry that you was food poison. Okay, so what can I do? What can we do? Make sure that... Okay, just give him all love and affection, right? Rather than scolding. And that is coming from the affection. And the other, the mother scolding the child, is also out of affection. Both out of affection. Okay. Now the point is that if we examine so well, why should you scold? Why should, why should that mother or the father scold the child for being food poisoned. Why? Okay, so in fact this, this was what I noticed once. I was in the monastery and there was a local camp, local, the, say, the other, there's a camp for the lay people. And then from there a mother and a very young, very young child, maybe age four or five, maybe age four, and the child was reluctant to go, and the mother was dragging the child, and the child was crying, and the mother was leaving her like this, and the child was crying, mother was pretending as though like leaving the child, and then the child was again chasing the mother, and the mother comes and turns back, again the child stops. So the, the mother is scolding the child, dragging the child. Why is it because the mother doesn't love the child? If she doesn't love the child, she leaves the child. Finish. It's easy for the child, for the mother. But the mother, the mother is not leaving the child because of the love. And while loving the child, love means to help, to make the child happy. Now, not making happy, making her unhappy by scolding her, by dragging her. So why? Somehow we see that the love and affection that we display in most cases, if not 100%. 99% of the love and affection that we display, they are tainted. They are tainted. They are tainted with self-grasping and self-centered attitude. Somehow I, this I, this is attached there. Right? Okay. So this sense of I, very strong sense of I, either this is my child. Right? You should not become sick, not because of you, not because that you are a human being, because you are my child, my, right? So this sense of I, selfishness, that, when that is what underscores the love and affection, that is responsible for all these anxieties and say the, um, the all the experiences, undesirable experiences coming about. Okay, so we see that it is so healing for us, it is so relieving, so healing for us to release this self a little bit, to release this, to let go of this self a little bit. And why? In the first place, why are we grasping at this self too much? Why are we grasping at this self very strongly? Why? Because I love, I care, I love this self. And 
If this is the reason why you love yourself so much, what is the meaning of love? The meaning of love is to give the best to the individual, to give the best to this person to whom you love. Right? Now, in the process, you are not actually giving the best to you. You are harming yourself the most because you are making yourself very unhappy. So, just, just see. This, this is, say, I want the maximum happiness. I want the maximum happiness. And then, what measures have we taken to make it, to give the maximum happiness to yourself? By cherishing it so much, overly. This is how we have been doing since time, since time immemorial till today. But it did not succeed. We did not succeed. We always failed. Now, why not we give an attempt to form an alternate way? That is to do the opposite. Instead of grasping at it, just let go of this form for time being and see how it works. Instead of, instead of cherishing the self more, you start cherishing others. You start cherishing your start, start with family members, then with your neighbors, then with the people around you, at workplace, like this. Just see how you can expand your love and affection towards others. And to release the self and try to cherish others more. Right? So there what happens is that grasping the self is released. It's released. The more you release this, say the tension that we feel, the stress that we feel, then the same, the distress, all this that we feel is nothing but a mental experience. It's a mental experience. So this mind, when does it feel the stress and tension and so forth? It is all associated with the cognitive thought process. Cognitive thought process is associated with the cognitive thought process. So where we see I, I, I all the time, then automatically the mind gets congested. So the congestion, so when you, we are being bound by a row, you will not feel relaxed. You will feel that we are so tightly bound. We don't like it. We want to free ourselves. We want to relax ourselves. So for this, so this rope must be untied. Likewise, what is the rope in our case to have this tension is the what binds us so tightly. That is the self-centered attitude. Self-centered attitude mixed with self-grasping ignorance. Okay, so the idea here is how to, re how to, re to relax this. How to, how to let this self-centered attitude being more relaxed. On this one thing, another thing is that at times we may be unkind to the self in order to in order not to encourage self-centered attitude. We may be unkind to the self. This is also not a wise way. This is not a wise way. Because what's the problem is not the self. The problem is with the self-centered attitude. We have to make the distinction between the self and self-centered attitude. This self is so important. This self is so important. For example, one person, Mahatma Gandhi, the father of the nation, Mahatma Gandhi, one person is able to was able to liberate how many millions of Indians from the from the from the enslavement by the Britishers. One person is able to do that. So that one person is so precious. Likewise, each one of us. We have that capacity. So as a person is so precious, so important. What is wrong is not the person, it's the self-centered attitude. We have to undermine the self-centered attitude, don't undermine the self. So have, have no self-hate. Never have self-hate. If you really want to hate someone, hate the self-centered attitude. Okay. So for this, instead of, instead of being unkind to the self, how to release this, how to let go of this self-centered attitude is by slowly increasing the circle of affection. Earlier the circle of affection is so narrow to the cell. Don't, don't, don't remove this, 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 this circle of the affection to the cell. Maintain it, just expand it, expand the circle, of, maintain the same degree of love and affection to the cell. Meanwhile, expand it, do reduce, expand, keep expanding to your families, to your neighbors, to your the colleagues, the work at colleague or at workplace. Keep expanding it.
keep expanding it, then you see that you become happier and happier and happier. So this happens, you come to discover that is because of the expansion of the circle of, circle of love and affection. And they become so precious for you. They become so precious for you. So at times you see that they are more precious than myself. And then the more you reach out, more happy you become. For finally what you want is not a matter I should cherish myself or cherish others. Finally what I want is I want to be happy. And whatever gives you the maximum happiness, go for it. And from this method we come to know that by cherishing others more, the more we become happy. So cherish others for your own benefit. So meanwhile, by cherishing others, everybody will be benefited and you are the first one. You are the one to be benefited the most. Okay, this is so important. So for that, we have to learn how to let go of this cherishing, of the grasping and the self. And of course, we need to make a distinction between the self-grasping and the self-cherishing. Okay, we are done with 246. Now 247. Okay, 247. If the impermanent discontinues, how could they be grasped at present? If indeed this were true, no one would have ignorant ignorance either. Okay, so for this we need to know what the Buddha, what the four seals of Buddha taught. The first seal of Buddha taught was all composite things are impermanent. All composite things are impermanent. And now the author. Bodhisattva Aryadi Acharya Aryadi, what he's saying is that if the impermanent discon discontinues, Buddha said, all composite things are impermanent. So, what the Buddha taught, all composite things are impermanent. So, the world that we experience, right? Okay, this is also very helpful for us if we can reflect on the, the reality of the impermanence, reality impermanence of yourself. Reality of impermanence of one's own the family members. Reality of impermanence of the universe in which we live. This is so important. This is so important. When we think about it, it's quite scary. When we think about the impermanence of your near and dear ones, it's quite scary. But this is a fact. This is a fact. And the more we think about it, when the actual day comes, when the actual day comes, you will, not, you will not be shocked as much. You will not be shocked and you may not go into deep depression at that point if you are able to reflect on impermanence from the early on. Okay, so this impermanence, the connotation of impermanence, this impermanence, when you speak about impermanence, people have the wrong impression. Impermanence means something which exists and then suddenly it disappears. This is impermanence. This is a very gross understanding of impermanence. Impermanence, there are two. One is the gross impermanence, and the other one is subtle impermanence. Gross impermanence is the discontinuation of the continuum of an object. Discontinuation of the continuum of the object is known as the gross impermanence. For example, say 2016. 2016 is gone now. It's gone now. 2016. It existed once. It is gone now. It will never come back. 2016 will never come back. So the continuum as of 2016 has ceased. That is a gross impermanence. For example, say the, the beautiful flower or the beautiful sunshine. Delhi, I don't know. There's sunshine. The, we talk about sunshine? No? Better not have sunshine in Delhi. Sometimes in January. Okay. Yes, in January, February. That's true. January, February, then we, we, we crave for sunshine. That's true, that's true. Okay, Delhi in January, February. Delhi in January, February, uh, say, okay, say the beautiful sunshine, January uh, 2017. January 2017, beautiful warm sunshine in Delhi. January, not, not March, May, right? Okay, so that's sunshine very beautiful sunshine and it's gone. Now it will, that particular sunshine will never come back. That is the gross impermanence. Right? Gross impermanence. Okay. Once I remember, remember, I might be in my class, I think five, class five, which means age 
maybe 11, 12 a year. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. I think usually it's like 10, 10, in my case 12 years old. I think maybe I was, I think class 5 a year, okay, class age 12. I was from, say, I was, the school was more in a, the a slow, slow, and at the base was the basketball ground, and just rising up, then the school houses, school homes were built in row, in row. And I was standing somewhere at the slope up, up there. And from there I was looking down what the people were doing around the basketball ground. And they were, I could still remember the two or three, two I could remember, two teachers, two teachers, there were actually three. And Tibetans, you, we used to have the, the long, they say, prayer flags, standing, right? Poles, flag poles. It's not really the, the flag poles, it's prayer flag poles. Prayer, prayer flag poles. Every year, every year, Tibetan New Year, they change. Before Tibetan New Year, they change. And it corresponded to that time. Before Tibetan New Year, they were changing this, and it's huge because of which the say the many staff they were helping. They, they were doing this work, and I don't know what really made me to think like this. I was just watching them. I was very young, watching them, and particularly three staff. I just. Well, I was telling myself, I told myself that these three staff, now today I could remember two. Third one, I don't know what happened to me, to my mind. Two, I could still remember. Two of them were there, I could still remember the faces. Said, this is impermanent. When I was 12 years old, this is impermanent. The three staff there working with, the, erecting this, the, uh, the, the prayer flag pole impermanent, they will change, they will not last like this. This was a thought came to me when I was 12 years old. So now when I think about this, this is amazing. These thoughts are so important for us. We have to think about these things, the reality, that today we are together here, and after two years, three years, four years, we never know. And then recently, I read somewhere that somebody gave a birthday gift to one girl, the girl, the rest, and the girl um, rest 18 years, 18 years birthday, 18 birthday. She was given a gift and the gift has consisted of letters written by the family friends when she was born. And the two parents, the two parents, what they did was that the two parents, they collected these letters, they requested their family friends to write letters for this young girl, day one old girl, so that they could open this when he, she reaches 18 years old. Then, when she reached, then opened, and of the, I think there were like 17 or 18 people who wrote the, the letters, and seven were gone by then. When she read the letters, seven were already gone, seven were already impermanent, right? So the point is that it is actually extremely important for us to think about impermanence. This will help us greatly, greatly, greatly to, 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 to help us to tackle, to deal with the tragedies in the future. But this is so important, one. And then once we have that experience, then our mind will be more calm, that we are not being shocked, we are not being, we don't become too vulnerable to the external situation, external factors. When something goes wrong, tragedy happens, instantly we go through trauma, we go through, say, we become paranoid, right? Or we become hysterical. So these things um, may not happen if we are able to reflect on the impermanence at this stage. So there, how you become more calm is very different from how somebody becomes calm because of some mundane ways of reflection or say whatever. 
So with this, when you reach that level of the calmness because of the reflection of the impermanence, then we can emphasize more how to dissolidify the self. Find the problem is with I will be. So for example, when somebody dies, then I will be alone. Then when I grow older, then I may lose my memory, then I have this problem, I have that problem. I have. So it's all to do with the I. So if you're able to dissolidify the self, then this fear of the same misgivings happening to the self will go away altogether. So for that purpose, the, the third seal, the first one is all composite things are impermanent. Number two is all contaminated things are of suffering nature. As long as we are under the sway of the contaminations, self-grasping ignorance, self-centered attitude, we will never be happy. All contaminated things are of suffering nature. It will only give us sufferings and miseries. How to get rid of these miseries? Yes, there is a way out. Yes, there is a way out. How to get rid of the miseries? Just look at the root cause of the miseries, cut that, and the miseries will come to an end. And what is the root cause? Ignorance is the root cause. And how to cut the ignorance? It is by, say, just as the darkness can be eliminated by introducing light, it is by introducing light of the wisdom that the darkness and ignorance can be eliminated. What is the wisdom? The wisdom is the mind whose apprehension of the object tallies with the reality. What is the reality? The third seal. Everything is of the nature of emptiness, selfishness. This is so precious. Precious, if you really don't want to go through the nightmare of life, if you really don't want to go through the nightmare of the life, if you don't really want to go through to become paranoid or say traumatic in our life, the best thing to do is prepare from today, from now on. How? By lighting, knowing that all these the miserable experiences, they are rooted to the ignorance, it is through the lighting, the wisdom, through getting some experience of this third line, everything is of the nature of emptiness and selflessness. So see how much we can get some experience of this third line. This is so precious. So if I'm, I personally, again, is a sharing, I personally always, 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 before cultivating, before generating the bodhicitta, I always reflect on the four seals. These four seals, one, all composite things are impermanent. Number two, all contaminated things are self in nature. Number three, everything is of the nature of emptiness, selflessness. And what is the benefit of this fourth seal? Transcending, this is how you transcend your sorrow. So this will give you the lasting peace. Transcending sorrow is absolute peace. Okay, this is what I do, and this would be extremely, extremely beneficial for us if you can do that. So, from this we see that point number three is so important that everything is of the nature of emptiness, selflessness. So as a part of that, and say 247, it says, if the impermanent discontinues, impermanence, as we said earlier, which is of two kinds, the gross and the subtle. The gross one, we always spoke about the, say, the beautiful things disappearing altogether, right? And the what, what once is so famous is no more famous now. What once was so attractive is no more attractive now. What once was so young is no more young now. What once was so systematic has now become so unsystematic, disorganized now. Once a very standard, prestigious institution now collapsed into chaos. All these things we see in this, this world. For example, say, like, perhaps 500, 1,000 years ago, the kings look at the, all these the ruins, all these ruins of the fortress, the fort, the fortresses, and so forth. So these are the clear evidence that people who first constructed these, who first constructed these, they thought that they did not have any thought of the impermanence, that my kingdom, me, my family, my kingdom. Now where is the kingdom? Even the trace has got gone. Even the trace, they're all gone, right? So they're all now going to the museums 
And this will only indicate this is the reality of permanence. If we can, the more we think about this, this will really help us. Okay. So the this subtle impermanence, subtle impermanence is while the continuum is there, the momentariness involved within the continuum. Momentariness involved within the continuum, or in other words, momentariness. Momentariness of the composite phenomena, that is the subtle impermanence. Momentariness. And then where there's a continuum, and the continuum can be, say, one day lasting, ten years lasting, or say, a few lifetimes lasting, or eternally lasting, continuum. So, eternal, continuum can be eternal, for some, our, life, our mind, our mind is eternal in nature, but it's impermanent. Eternal and permanent should not be mixed together. Eternal and permanent. Eternal has connotation which lasts forever. Our mind, the self, they last forever, but they last forever in a momentary fashion, in the form of momentariness. So, lasting forever and momentariness, there's no contradiction. So the self exists as eternally, as an eternal agent, meaning that lasting forever, but existing in a momentariness, in the fashion of the momentariness, which means the self is impermanent while it lasts eternally. Okay, so the point is, if the impermanent discontinues, page two for, uh, stanza 247, page 30, stanza 247, if the impermanent discontinues means that if you understand impermanence to mean something which discontinues, if you understand, for example, when the Buddha said all composite things are impermanent, okay, which means if somebody dies and then the person doesn't continue. <coughs> if this is how you understand by impermanence, if the impermanent discontinues, meaning if the impermanence is how you interpret as discontinuing, the continuum. How could they be a grass at present? Grass today is the result of the grass 2016. Grass, a grass growing in the lawns. In the lawns, they are the result of the grass growing in 2016. So 2016 grass is no more existent today. They are already gone. Now they have become the 2017 grass. 2016 grass Gone means it's impermanent. So by being impermanent, if you understand that, uh, that to mean as discontinuation, then the 2000 grass should discontinue and today's grass should not come into being. If the impermanent discontinues, how could they be a grass at present? Because the pre present grass is a continuation from yesterday's grass, past grass. If indeed this were true, no one would have ignorance either. So for example, our ignorance today, are we full of wisdom or we, we, are, we have the ignorance? We have the ignorance. And this ignorance came from where? Okay, so is it that, for example, say, is it that yesterday I was not as compassionate and today I become as compassionate as His Holiness the Dalai Lama, right? Suddenly, right? So we're not like this. So how, then, how come that we are not as compassionate as holy as the Dalai Lama? Because yesterday, we did not practice as much as he did. We are the result of yesterday's Dorji. Now what made yesterday's Dorji not so successful in the practice of compassion or whatever? Because of two days ago's Dorji. So you go back in time like this. So this ignorance today is a result of yesterday's ignorance. If the yesterday's ignorance is impermanence, in the form of discontinuation of the continuum, then yesterday's ignorance should stop, is no more today. It stop, should not continue today. So today's ignorance will not arise. So nobody should have ignorance today. But in actuality, we do see that people have ignorance even today. Which means, what's the problem? Problem is with the wrong way of understanding the meaning of impermanence. So how should we understand impermanence? It should not be understood as a discontinuation of the continuum. It should be understood as momentariness. Anything which undergoes momentary change, that is the meaning of impermanence and not as discontinuation of a continuum. 
Okay, 248. Even if the self exists, form is seen to arise from other causes. Okay, so now um, the self, the self to be believed to be a permanent agent, permanent agent, permanent agent, even if the self exists, form is seen to arise from other causes. Same, the the flower, the food, the house, and these the other things, other things, um, they are seen to arise from their respective causes. They are seen to arise from respective causes. So, um, there are various versions of how things come into production. There are various versions. Some believe that it is a, it is the the Creator God, external external agent known as Creator God, which is responsible for, for creating all phenomena. And some people, some philosophers think that the self, the self exists, the self exists as the ultimate reality. And then when you misconceive the self from there, then the rest of the things proliferate. This is, in fact, I would say that India, India is such a, I would say is, I would say was. India was such a rich, it was a land which gave birth to a rich philosophical tradition. Philosophy, so rich in philosophical tradition. All these various traditions, various versions of the concept of the creation came into being in India. And then some would say it's the karma. It's the karma which is responsible for giving rise to all phenomena. Okay, there's so many of them. One of which says that it is a misperception of the self, then from there, more likely the self with a misperception, then everything proliferates out of that. So what Ari Deva is saying is that even if this such a self exists, but we do see that this table comes into being from the tree, not from the self, from the tree. And the tree came from being from the earlier seed. And then earlier seed came from the previous, previous seed. Will we go on like this? It is more like the evolutionary theory as said by Charles Darwin. It's very much like evolutionary theory. So this is what Aradeva is saying, is that, for example, saying, even if the, the self is there, but you work hard, and there are people around you, there are circumstances around you, then good things will happen. Right? So we see that even if self exists, form, physical form like the flower, the food and so forth, they are seen to arise from other causes, but not from this self. This is, this is a fact. Okay, to continue my virtue by virtue of others, to continue, and these physical forms and so forth, they continue, they arise from, they arise from other factors, and then they continue like this, by virtue of still other factors, they continue like this. And they also disintegrate through other factors. To for them, just as a sprout, which is a product, is produced from a pro the product, the seed, similarly all that is impermanent comes from impermanent. Okay, so what he's saying is that today we have the, the lunch. What lunch did you have? Rice? No, rice was there, right? And the rice came from the rice seedling. Rice came from the rice seedling. So this rice seedling came from the rice seed. And the rice seed again came from another rice seedling. So keep going like this. Keep going like this. We can say track up to like say the before the evolution of the human beings. We can track, go back. Then if we still go back tracking, we can go back track in terms of the the constituencies like atoms, electrons, so forth, which constitute the today's, the rice that we ate. If you go back to see where, where these atoms, they came from, it came back as early as 15 billion years ago, like the Big Bang. Big Bang as believed to have happened by the physicist 15 billion years ago. The Big Bang, it happened from there. So these atoms, they, they do not come from this, the, from me, from self. It came from his own respective causes. You keep going like this. So this is just as the sprout, 249, just as a sprout, which is a product today, 
the sprout, which is product, is produced from another product. What is that product? It's from its own seed. The seed was a product with respect to its earlier seedling seed. Similarly, all that is impermanent, all impermanent phenomena, they arise only from impermanent phenomena. Arise from a cause which is impermanent. Only if the cause is changing, then they, you can see the effect changing. If the cause is permanent, then the effect cannot be impermanent. Okay. Similarly, all that is impermanent comes from impermanent phenomena, not from a permanent phenomena. 250. Now, having accepted, having learned these things, to see that even this self is also impermanent. This self, I, this I is also impermanent. That the sense of solidification of the self is loosened or is dissolidified. Once that happens, then Will we turn into nihilism when we say that such a, such a cell, very concrete, permanent thing, does not exist? Does it mean that we slide into the extreme of nihilism? This question. So 250, this is to say that, and that while, while disolidifying the self and the self grasping is loosened a little bit, still we can follow the middle way. We can be uh, we can be freed of the two extremes. So this is summary made here in stanza two five zero. Since functional things arise, there is no discontinuation. Discontinuation meaning that things fall into nihilism. That things don't continue anymore. This is discontinuation or nihilism. S saying that since functional things arise, things continue to arise. Things continue to arise. So therefore, discontinuation doesn't happen. There's a continuation ha happening. Continuation, discontinuation is what? Nihilism. Because things arise, we are free from nihilism. One. Number three, stanza three. And because they cease, they cease, there's no permanence. Because the, the, the causes, when the results arise, the causes stop. You agree with me or not? When the apple tree arises, then the apple seed stops. Apple seed stops. Apple seed does not exist anymore when the apple tree comes out of that. When the results come into being, the causes stop. Causes stop means causes are not permanent anymore. Causes are not permanent. And because they cease, they meaning the seed or the causes. Because the causes cease, they stop at the time of the result, the, the causes are not permanent. Causes are not permanent meaning that we are freed from the extreme of permanence. We are freed from the extreme of nihilism, we are freed from the extreme of permanence. This, the being freed from the two extremes is known as following the middle way. Okay. So from this, from this, we come to know that the same all problems somehow okay so let us say from here just feel free to share your the pains any kind of pains that you have been through in your life any pains that you have been through in life unless you want to keep it confidential those less confidential things you can share with us anyone any pain that you have in your life anyone did you love Okay, no pain? Huh? Huh? I can't. Trying to make something very common, right? Headache problem. No, no something, not really devastating pain, no? Nothing of that happened in your life? Anyone else? Bosses being too bossy. The bosses being too bossy, okay. Yes, over there, and then energy. Yeah, three years ago I fell and I broke my ankle. Okay, yeah, three years ago. I was on a wheelchair for two months and I could tell everything became so difficult. Okay, so two years, two, two years or three years ago? Two years. Two years ago, fell and broke his broke her ankle and things become so difficult. Very good. Anyone else? Like this? Don't say something very common, my headache. Anyone else? No problem. Wow, lucky. <laughs> yes, here.
Okay, three years ago, fell from the school bus or the school bus fell? Okay, fell from the moving bus. Or fell from the moving bus and then spinal cord fracture and then severe problem started from there. Okay, good. Anyone else? If you have lived long enough, I think there is nobody, unless he's not talking about it, who has not suffered or gone through pain. I think it's the essential part of living itself. Exactly, exactly. So, we have all gone through a lot of pain, we may not talk about it, that's a separate issue. Yes. And many, much of that pain, some of it is physical like some people have mentioned, but some of it is also a relationship pain, you know, emotional pain. A relationship pain like what? But relationships with close... Say your parent-children relationship, husband-wife, children, the children parents, brothers, sisters... Okay, you know. can, can you give me very specific? Say like, say, you know, say yourself, <laughs> with respect to your child, this is very, very well, good. I won't talk about my child, but I okay. talk about my elder sister. I, okay, okay. I, I, I had problems which uh, I thought got resolved last year. Wonderful. And then, unfortunately, it didn't. I mean, the compassion lasted only for about a year, year and a half, and then the whole thing broke up, broke up again. So I, I don't know. All I'm saying is that if you live long enough, then pain is part this, of life. This is a part of life. That's true. Very true. Anyone else? I only have one question for His Holiness. I do not know uh, whether this is the appropriate forum for it or it is not. But I find a lot of peace in listening to uh, the chant, Om Mani Padme Ram, and I listen to it every day in the evening. Could you please give me your understanding of this uh, chant and how should one listen? Very good. Thank you. Yes, I will do that for sure. Yes, and Gigi. I'll not forget your question. Uh, I wanted to share one of the experiences uh, of having experienced extreme pain. Seven years back, my business partner had a cerebral, cerebral stroke. So her left hand side got completely paralyzed. And in front of my eyes, I saw the eyes drooping, saliva coming out in the mouth. It was really, really painful. Fortunately, she came out of it because of a very good doctor and treatment. But this was really shocking. Uh -huh. Seeing it in front of your eyes, this is what happened to somebody who you know, love, work with. It's exactly, exactly. Yes, okay, thank you. So we see that all these pains, so why I'm asking these questions is because to identify how solidification of the self is involved with experiencing the pains, right? So we said that that all these problems, all these pains, somehow we are relating to experience which we had, which we had, right? When I go through this situation, when I when something happened to me like this, when something happened to my this like this, so somehow the pains are all associated with something with I. You're getting it? Now the more we solidify this I, more the pain will multiply. Less we solidify the I, less the pain will be. And the good thing, good news. The less we solidify the self, the more we embrace others. How to, to let disolidify the self is embracing others. The more we embrace others, then what happens? The more we pain in our, see in others, the more painful we will feel. It's not true. Don't forget it. This is the difference. The more we cherish the self, more the pain multiplies. The more we cherish others, the more we cherish others, right? Then we, when you see the pains in them, our pain will not multiply. We will become more courageous. This is the difference. We will become so courageous. 
we become so courageous. The more we embrace others, we become more courageous by seeing more the pains in others. This is so beautiful, right? Okay, so with this in mind, finally, see if, forget about philosophy, if you really don't want to have the pains, the acute corrosion of the pains within us, acute hollowness, acute hollowness of us at the loss of near and dear ones and so forth, what should be doing from today onwards, if we can do a little bit of exercise every day, just explore where am I? Just explore this. Not for any philosophical inquiries. It is just to quell our future prospective pains they are bound to happen to us. Just explore where is this I? Right? Am I a boy or a girl? I will say I'm a boy or I'm a girl. So this boyness or the girlness which I'm talking about is related to the body is that it has nothing to do with my mind. You're getting it? My, my body is not a self. How not? My body is again consists of so many parts. My heart Heart, trans heart transplant happens, which means I can remove my heart, I can get a new heart, but still this I still exists, which means my early heart was not me. Likewise, liver transplant is possible, kidney transplant is possible. So there from this we see that the physical body on the basis of which I am described as, I'm identified with, these things are not this self. Uh, what about my mind? My mind is also not me. Because I'm a, I'm a, ba I'm a boy. I'm a girl. Boyness or the girlness is on the basis of the body, not on the mind. Mind does not have a gender. But I have a gender. Which means that even this my mind is also not me. So where is this I? Where is this I? Right? And we cannot speculate our I which is different from the body and the mind. Something is different. Because I describe my, myself as a male and this is an undeniable fact and maybe for others we describe ourselves as a girl this is also an undeniable fact so, so this self is not different from the body and the mind if this body different from the body and mind then it cannot be described as male or female but simply because of the visible body visible body Female body, male body, on that basis, we describe ourselves as males or females. Likewise, we describe ourselves as compassionate person, short-tempered person, good person, bad person, on the basis of a mind. Again, if it is different from the mind, we cannot describe ourselves as good person, bad person, short-tempered, compassionate, like this. So we see that, see the, like the table, table, Top plank is not the table. The legs are not the table. Remove these parts, the table disappears. What's the table? Just putting them together, then we get a feeling that there's a table that that's enough. If you go to explore what the table is, it does not really exist from the object. This is reality. Likewise, if I explore into the self, my body and my mind, then this, this I disappears, this dolce disappears. So when these two come together, then my mind creates a sense of self. That's it. Beyond this, the self does not exist. So in other words, we don't have a solid self to grasp onto. So the very strong grasping stops. It relaxes. It relaxes. And then initially, you may, have a, you may get a, a tinge of fear in this experience. A tinge of fear may come to you. And the more you practice this, the more you practice this, this fear will be replaced by tremendous, tremendous peace of your mind. And this will guarantee, this will guarantee that when we go through very tragic incidents, you will not go through to, to, to become uh, the paranoid, you will not become, say, the, uh, the traumatic, right? You will not go into nightmare. So you are under control. So this, this practice will help us a lot. 
Okay, now, so what the, your name? My name is uh, Jadipur. Jadipur, okay. Huh? Jadi? Jadi Oberoi. Jadi Oberoi. Okay, so what Jadi Oberoi requested, I will quickly make it here. This is a very important point. As what is the, the meaning of the mantra of Mani Bebhum and what is the significance of this? I'll quickly explain this. Well, the meaning of this mantra is very simple. One, this mantra is actually the name, one of the names of Buddha of Compassion. One of the names of Buddha of Compassion and is known as Arya Avalokiteshvara. Arya Avalokiteshvara. And you must see the, the painting of Arya Avalokiteshvara. This is one of his names, Om Mani Padme Hum, one of his names. And he chose this name, he chose this name, Om Mani Padme Hum, as his name for an incredibly important reason. Reason to help anybody who hears this mantra, anybody who hears this chant, anybody who ch chants this mantra, anybody who reflects on the meaning of this mantra in the name of the Aravalokiteshvara, will be healed from within, healed of the mental stress, mental pains and so forth by imbuing the seed of compassion within. Finally, when the seed of compassion is instilled within us, anger dissolves and anger is the one which consumes our immune system that destroys our health. So by planning, by the recitation of mantra, by this chant of the Omani Padmahum, then the seed of compassion is instilled in us constantly. And the anger is taken away, taken away all the time. Then as the anger subsides, the person becomes more and more peaceful and the immune system gets built up. On the basis of this, the person will be much, much healthier. And anybody who's around the person, the, they will feel that vibration of peace from you. Okay, this is the benefit and the meaning of this mantra is this mantra is constituted of six syllables. Six syllables Om Ma Ni Pat Me Hum. Six syllables. This is also known as the six syllable mantra. So, these six syllables, how to understand the meaning? Very simple. Om is one, Mani, second and third, put together. Number two, Patma or Patma, number four and five put together, and then Hum. Okay, Om. This Om, this syllable is made of three letters A, U, Ma. So this is Sanskrit, A, U, Ma. And the A, U, Ma symbolizes the body, speech, and mind. A symbolizing the body, U symbolizing the speech, and Ma symbolizing the mind. So, Om, when you recite Om, we should be mindful of the three letters, A, U, Ma, symbolizing my body, special mind, and the body, special mind of the enlightened beings. Yeah? So with this mantra, it, you should be reminded that my body should change into the body of the enlightened being. My speech should change into the speech of the enlightened being. My mind should change into the enlightened being's mind, right? Oh, when we recite this, we should be mindful that that I should be changing my body, speech, and mind into the body, speech, and mind of the enlightened beings. How? It is through, say, the, the diamond, the diamond, when thrown into garbage, garbage, and particularly in the sewage, you pick it up, it's so dirty, so dirty, and the ordinary people will throw this, but the experts will not throw this. Experts will remove the filth, remove the dirt, one by one, one by one. Remove the dirt in process, right? Likewise, more than this diamond is the perfect seed of compassion that exists within us. Each one of us, we have that seed. Each one of us has that seed. So when this seed becomes vibrant, our body will become the Buddha's body, our speech will become the Buddha's speech, and our mind will become the enlightened, the mind of the enlightened being. So, how to make a body, speech, mind into the body, speech, mind of the enlightened being is by making this diamond-like, diamond-like, the seat of the, the the perfection within us to manifest fully. How to make how to make it manifest fully? 
by Mani and Pekma. Syllable number two, three, and four and five. Two, three, Mani. Mani in Sanskrit means the jewel. Mani in Sanskrit means the jewel. So the, what is the job of the jewel? Job of the jewel, job of the gem is to fulfill the wishes of us. Fulfill our wishes. If you have a diamond, what is the job of the diamond? Diamond is when we, when we need something, we will sell a part of it and we'll get what the resource we, uh, we want. So this jewel is symbolic of, this jewel is the external jewel and this is symbolic of the internal jewel. Internal jewel is the internal quality within you which attracts all the good things that you want. What is that thing? Compassion. With compassion, practice compassion, it attracts every good thing that you want. For example, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, right? His Holiness the Dalai Lama, he does not have to stay for, say, like five or six, seven hours the way I did today. His Holiness just comes in the public and shows his face for five minutes. All these thousands of people, thousands and thousands of people, they get the maximum happiness which they never experience in their life. Just simply by seeing his face, what made him so special? It is because of his compassion. So this compassion gives what people want, the happiness people want. And seeing that people have benefited, he's so happy. So he gets everything because of his compassion. He's so popular, right? And everybody is in favor of, oh, I like to give something to him which makes him happy. Everybody wants to give it. And if we want as many people to do that, nobody does it. But for him, everybody wants to give this car, that car, this house, whatever, right? So everything is attracted because of his quality of compassion. So quality of compassion is the gem line, it's the true gem, money. So this money is symbolic of the quality of compassion. Okay, so it says that how can we make this, how can we make this, the say, the, the diamond ultimate of source of happiness within us to come out is by the practice of the compassion, which is symbolized by the money. Next one is Padma. Padma is the lotus. Lotus is born in a muddy water, but when it comes out, it remains untainted by the mud from which it grew. Right? It remains untainted. So therefore, the say the wisdom, the wisdom, the knowledge, which is so important, the wisdom, this wisdom should grow from within us. We are very dirty at the moment. From this very dirty person, this wisdom should grow. And this wisdom it should be like a lotus, should not be tainted by ignorance. Right? Now, say for example, if somebody wants to become a, a professor in physics, right? Say somebody wants to become a the small children, small children, small children. They all everyone is saying that oh, we want to become a professor. I want to become a professor in physics. And when they reach the college, when they reach college, say one boy so brilliant in school, always the topper, always the topper. And the boy um, said, what do you want to do? I want to become, uh, become a professor in physics. And yet, when in college, he always ends up in pubs. Always ends up in pubs, no, not in the laboratory. Not in physics, physics laboratory, not in the laboratory, always in the pubs. Although he's so bright, can we expect him to become a professor in physics? No. Now there is another boy, another boy, uh, who's always in the laboratory, always in the library, with the books all the time, right? But even in the college, his mathematical skill is 2 plus 2 equals 20. Can we expect him to become a professor? What is he lacking? He's lacking the intelligence. What is the other boy lacking? Intelligence? No, he's lacking the enthusiasm, right? Enthusiasm. This diamond, this diamond within you has the capacity not only to make you happy, but to make everyone happy. So which means you should have the enthusiasm, compassion, enthusiasm to make this diamond accessible to all beings.
So that is done by the compassion towards all beings. So this compassion, this compassion is like the enthusiasm. When you lack this, you will not strive to make this come out. And the other one is the, the Padma, symbolizes the, the wisdom. So without the wisdom, it is like the child who says 2 plus 2 equals 20. When in college, we can't expect the person to become a physics professor. So more than the professor is become the fully enlightened being to benefit all sentient beings. So for that, we need the best of the enthusiasm and the best of the, the wisdom. So the best of the wisdom is symbolized by the lotus. The best of the enthusiasm is symbolized by the compassion like money. Right? So, Om Mani Padma. So how to make this Om reality? How to make my body, speech, mind into the body, speech, mind of the enlightened beings is by the practice of the compassion like, no, is by the practice of the money like, the jewel like, compassion symbolized by the money, and is by the practice of the wisdom symbolized by the lotus. So, what is, what is left now? Hom is left. Hom says that money and the, the lotus, compassion and the knowledge should not be practiced in isolation. Should be practiced in union. Hom is the symbolic of the need for the union of the wisdom and the compassion. This is the meaning of Om Mani Padma Hom. Thank you. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. And I'm always confused by this choice of word method because it seems like the wisdom of emptiness is the method. Okay. So I don't understand why method is used as a parallel translation for, for the wisdom. Yeah. Okay, this is a good question. Did you all follow the question? Yes. Wisdom is also a method to get to the enlightenment. So why the compassion part? Other side is method versus the wisdom why the wisdom is excluded from the method side this is not excluded it seems like the method no it is excluded yes. although from your point of view it is the best method it is a method yes. it is a method the driving force and the driving force and the actual method yes. right but here what we say is that the the driving side the force yes. is the method and the wisdom okay this is a very good point. In fact, in Tibetan, wisdom is shira. What we translate as method in Tibetan is tab. Tab she. Tab is the method. She is the shira wisdom. Tab and shira. Tab has several connotations. Tap has several connotations. Tap, one connotation is the method, very simple method. Another one is more like a say, say for example, if I want the table and the table is moving, what I really want is the table. And then in order to stop the, the, the table from moving, what should I do? You should put what? Some veg. Some veg, right? So veg is a means means to keep it stable right that is a means to keep it stable the wisdom which actually which will actually make you to move that they got they wisdom will move but the what we call is the method in tap tap has connotation to make it move make the wisdom move like you know say the the wedge to keep the the, the table stable right that is another connotation as like a means, as like a means to make the, as like a say, the skillful part, which makes the actual means, wisdom of emptiness, to work. Right? This has the corner, this is the second connotation. So, in a loose sense, we translate it as method. But compassion is ninja. Compassion is ninja, yeah. And top is top. No. Top, compassion is it falls under the category of the tap. See, all Dharma practices can be summarized into tap and shirap. Tap is the method of the means, and the shirap is the 
wisdom. So these fall under these two categories. Compassion always falls under the tab or the, the method. What we translate as the method. Right? Okay, this is... So when things are translated from one language to another, source language to the target language, so there's always some problems there. Always some problems. So therefore, it is very important for us instead of interpreting the words, words directed by yourself, first we have to listen what it is meant in the original context. It is very important. Yeah. Very good. Okay, that's it. We'll stop here for the quick and direction prayer. Page 309. Yes, yes. There's another question. Gisha, uh, you mentioned that more we embrace other, others, more courageous we become. But other uh, unless uh, either we genuinely have developed capacity, you know, one is just the aspiration part, but when actually helping, uh, I sometimes feel it's more like helplessness because you want to help but you do not have the capacity. Helplessness and the courage, these two are different. Not only different, mm -hmm. these two are not contradictory. Person can be very courageous and still remain helpless. You're getting it? In fact, the Bodhisattvas, they're so courageous and there's a mention, even there, there are so many aspirations of Bodhisattvas not accomplished. Not accomplished means helpless. I can't, there's nothing that I can do. There's no contradiction between becoming helpless, becoming overwhelmed by helplessness. When somebody is helpless, you can become overwhelmed. One may not be overwhelmed. Yes, Professor Manakshi Ji? Expand? 